Good morning and a very warm welcome to you to this discussion around China's place in the globe, in the world, um, in the context of its 14th, 5th year plan, five year plan. Um, very pleased to welcome you to this Friends of Europe debate uh, that looks at uh, the context of this new five year plan and what it means for the world and Europe in particular. Uh, before I go into saying a few more words about by way of introduction, I want to just explain the rules of the game with you. So those of you who are Zoom savvy will know to make sure your screen is on, you have your name and make sure you're on mute. Those of you who wish to raise a question, a query, please don't hesitate to use your virtual hand. Those of you who don't know where it is, if you go to this uh, um, icon symbol that says participants, press on that and you'll find your virtual hand and raise that. That'll indicate to me that you want to come in and we'll make sure we can get as many of you into this discussion as possible. Those of you who are watching this live stream, you are not disincluded. Uh, we wel welcome you warmly also. And please make sure you use hashtag FOE debate to be able to put in your, your question, query, uh, and whatever it is you want to raise to our audience as well as our speakers. So that's the rules of the game, if you like. Finally, um, you'll find that the Zoom chat is a very good device. Uh, what you can do in there is to make sure that you can engage in this discussion, please do post your comments, queries, because we only have an hour and sometimes we don't get to all of you. So what we try and do is make sure that it's all recorded um, and your questions will post to any of the contributors that we have uh, on, on the panel with you for you today, this morning. So please don't hesitate to use the Zoom function, the chat function, but also use it as an opportunity to engage in a dialogue and a debate about this particular issue. So that, that's the kind of context in terms of how we uh, run the show, if you like. Uh, but just by way of introduction, we have obviously a context in which um, I'm not going to go through what we all know about the pandemic and the economic crisis. Uh, what we do know is uh, that China has been, you know, head start out of the, uh, the economic crisis in terms of growth signs. We know it's the economy, largest one of the largest economies in the world, that's actually shown uh, a better economic performance uh, last quarter, this quarter, and it's showing that it's actually investing um, much more in those elements that we, we are known to be uh, the roots of success, namely uh, R&D, looking at infrastructure, etc. and so forth. We know that unlike any other uh, part of the globe, China has the capacity, has for a long time, the ability to plan long term, something which many Western states don't do and fail to do, perhaps at their cost. Well, let's, see, let's, let's find out what we shall see. Um, but the context for this debate is very much the concept of dual circulation. What does it mean? What does that actually have in its place and it's what it's in store for both China, the region, uh, Asia more widely, and most importantly, uh, also um, what, what it means for Europe in terms of trade, partnership and relationships. So, on that note, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome first the Minister Councillor for the Ch uh, Mission for China, and it's Zheng Chang. It's very good to welcome you this morning. Zheng Chang, thank you for being with us. Um, Minister Councillor, please tell us uh, in your words um, why in this context, this notion of dual circulation is important at this stage. So, so help, us, help us set the framework for this conversation. Over to you and a warm welcome. Thank you, Damendra, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to distinguished panel members and uh, all the participants. Uh, I'm delighted to be here at this symposium today, and uh, I've seen a quite distinguished panel, and I'm very happy to be here. And I think today's topic, dual circulation, is quite important, particularly to us Chinese. But I think that uh, given now the people everywhere in the world are quite interested in China's development, so probably it's also a good opportunity to shed some light on dual circulation and the background and the rationale behind this dual circulation. And just now I would like to thank uh, Damendra for the good words about China's performance, but I think uh, everybody knows clearly that now the pandemic is far from being over. Uh, in this era of the pandemic, everybody keeps saying that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Now, we can also put it in the economic perspective. I don't think any country can be in a sustainable position to prosper until every other country is in a better position to prosper together. 
That's the first thing I would like to make clear. Back to today's topic about uh, the dual circulation. We know that China's parliament just this month, early this month, adopted the 14th five-year plan and the long-range objectives through the year 2035, which set the course for China's development in the next five years and beyond. In my opinion, to truly understand dual circulation and to take the pulse of China's future development, what is important is to have a deep understanding of the three new things we talk about back in China. Uh, the new development stage, the new development philosophy, and the new development paradigm, which refers to the dual circulation. We all know that uh, due to the unremitting efforts in the past decades, China has made historical achievements in economic and social development. And last year, our GDP, for the very, very first time ever, exceeded the 100 trillion yuan mark for the first time, about 1.3, about 13 trillion euros, actually. And also, we have lifted about 800 million people out of poverty of the past about four decades. Against such a backdrop, China has entered what we call a new development stage, and, which means that our economy is now transitioning from high-speed growth to high-quality development. And our focus is now shifting from quantity to quality from whether we have development or not to whether our development is good enough. So this is the very first new thing, the new development stage. And the second new thing is the new development philosophy, the principles we must follow in our development from now on. And it has five features, innovative development, coordinated development, green development, open development, and shared development. Among the five principles, it is not too difficult for everybody else to see that there is much common ground that we can find and build together between China and Europe. For example, open development, innovative development, and green development. And also in green development, and also the shared development, we can also find more common ground between China and Europe in sustainable development. So this is about the second new thing. Uh, I don't think you, uh, you, you are strange to the idea that the last year China also put forward new goals for its actions to tackle the climate change. And China also pledged last year to peak its carbon emissions in 2030 and realize carbon neutrality in 2060. In the latest 14th five-year plan, we also rolled out measures to reach the target, including reducing the energy consumption per unit GDP by 13.5% and the CO2 emissions by 18%. And now all sectors in the Chinese society, from governments of various levels to enterprises, the general public, from producers, consumers, investors, and regulators, we are taking actions together to promote energy conservation, emission reduction, and green development. So you can see China not only has the will and the five-year plan to honor its climate change commitment, but also has taken and is taking and will take more wide-ranging and down-to-earth concrete steps toward that goal every step of the way. The third new thing I'm going to talk about is the new development paradigm, which refers to the dual circulation. It answers the question of how China will achieve this kind of development. To be specific, we would like to create a new development paradigm in which the domestic circulation will be the mainstay and the domestic and the overseas circulation reinforce each other. And certainly this will create huge opportunities for both China and Europe to tap 
in the coming months <coughs> and the decades. And I will not go to the details in the opening remarks. Sure, please. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. So I think that uh, both sides have a lot to discuss, to work together, and both sides are actually in a position, given the circumstances we are now in, in the position to work together to enlarge the pie for both China, Europe, and the world at large. That's going to be good for China, good for Europe, and good for the whole world. Why shouldn't we do such good things together? That concludes my opening remarks. Thank you. Chen Chao, thank you very much for that. And that's really very helpful. But as you know, that um, there are very serious concerns uh, about what, the, what might be perceived by uh, many as a kind of an inward focused approach. And as what we know from our kind of past 25 years and the trajectory of China's development, the West has become accustomed to an approach which has meant there has been a focus of trade uh, export uh, that has relied very much on the approach that China has done and also global supply chains. We know that the pandemic has changed all that. We know politics has changed that. And we know that actually uh, during the Trump era, things got even worse. Uh, thankfully, we have a, a different tone uh, adopted, but still the geopolitics of trade, world relations and economics are very closely aligned. And I'm sure people in particular, this audience, both in China and across the globe and from Europe, will be interested in what does it actually mean in practice for business, trade, European companies and companies in the region. So I hope that you'll come back to us uh, in response to some of those issues. Um, but I want to bring in, if I may, uh, a professor who is steeped it's in Beijing, steeped in issues around business and trade. And that's Fong Fong. Very warm welcome to you. Good to have you with us. Just need you to... Un yeah, hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Very, uh very warm welcome to you, Fong. Thank you for being with us. Um, Fong, if, you may, if I may, can I ask you to explain what's, you know, the, the kind of the concept that's really underpinning this, this new plan, this new five, uh, five year plan uh, of dual circulation, and what you think it'll mean for both businesses within China, the region, and Europe in particular. But I need you to be brief. But thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kalani. And um, thank you for inviting me to have this dialogue with uh, friends of Europe. It's my great pleasure to share uh, with you my thoughts about the dual circulation. And well, uh, I hope my uh, opening remarks could give some response to your question. So I, I do think it's a misreading when uh, when people would uh, regard this dual circulation as a signal that uh, China uh, is decoupling from the world. Uh, because if you look at the history of Chinese economic development, you will find uh, this uh, dual circulation, actually, I think it's uh, more about some kinds of sum up of the past experience of China's uh, economic development. Uh, so you see before the implementation of the uh, reform and the opening up in the 1980s, China's economy was very much more like uh, domestic circulation with very little collection with the world. Uh, we were in an era of planned economy at that time. So that means since everything was uh, applied, so the government told us what to produce, uh, how to produce, at what cost, and even about what to consume. So uh, it took us more than uh, took us decades to realize the problem of these kinds of applied economy, and that was really a bad example of enclosed economy, which I think we will never want to go back again. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it was in 2006, the 11th five-year plan, uh, we changed it into a kind of outline. Uh, that means the government, uh, well, just to clarify the key areas and directions of the development and set a goal for the whole society to work together. 
and uh, play a guiding role in the uh, the, the development of enterprises in, rather than some uh, direct interventions. So with this market-oriented reform and opening up to the outside world, especially after China's accession to the WTO, I think uh, we have adopted the export-oriented uh, mode, relying more on the international market for growth. And I think we have achieved great success well, in this kind of policy. And I see no reason why uh, we, we should give up these kinds of integration uh, into the global world. But how, however, uh, while we try to push forward this international uh, circulation, we find out some problems inside. So for example, our domestic demand consumption uh, lagged far behind the rapid economic growth. And our domestic market has not yet been a unified big market uh, in a strict sense. So local uh, blockouts and uh, protections are still very common. And uh, that's to say the domestic circulation uh, was not, uh, that did not run smoothly. So uh, for example, it's difficult to trade the secondhand car in a different places. And some specific industries such as, uh, well, the traditional Chinese medicine drinks also see some entry barriers in different provinces. Mm -hmm. So uh, some local governments even uh, introduce some uh, produce, uh, procurement policies to support uh, local products. So it was in uh, 2008 during the global financial crisis. I think uh, we see a turning point of Chinese economy. So in order to promote domestic demand and consumption to resist these external risks, Chinese economy began to enter into a relatively balanced uh, development at home and abroad. And uh, the external environment is also changing. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this context, we highlight this domestic circulation and international circulation reinforce each other with a focus on the, maybe on the domestic circulation. Since we draw lessons from the past, we expect to further break down the barriers, not only between uh, the overseas market and the domestic market, but also in our internal market. So that is, we are going to strengthen out the relationship among uh, production, distribution, circulation, and consumption. So to eliminate internal obstacles to achieve this high quality development. So uh, it's not okay. only about preventing uh, external risks, but also about improving internal equality and efficiency. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not actually a decoupling from the world. It's, it's we just need, uh, want to do better, to better uh, involved in the world economy. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank, Fong, thank you very much. But you can, you know, you forgive uh, commentators who've looked at this, especially in the context of the pandemic, actually, and the economic crisis. We have seen a move, especially in the past three years, to, and heralded very much by a Trump administration of a kind of a protectionism and a me first agenda. And you'd, be, you'd forgive commentators for thinking that is this an example of protectionism and I'm sure others will comment on that but you're very clear that this is uh, what, what we're witnessing now is part of a very long-term plan and then an evolution of an economics both uh, economics and trade and consumption and production pattern that we've seen over years just adjusting itself to a new world order so thank you very much for that I'm sure people will come in I want all of you to I encourage you to make sure use the zoom chat use your virtual hand get ready to engage otherwise I'll just pick on you because this has to be an interactive conversation and you know the way that we run events at Friends of Europe the reason why you're here on zoom is because we believe it's not just the speakers but it's you in the audience who are also part of the brain that we need to engage and create a discussion so please don't hesitate to, to come in. I want to move to Eva. Eva, welcome. I'm okay. muted myself. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. You have a particular uh, take on this, given you know, the, the role you play um, as head of trade and investment section at the EU delegation in China. Um, from your point, you've heard what the you know, what Minister Council said and what Fong has said. What's your take on the implications for European trade investment and companies? Um, will they be, you know, what's your, what, what's, what's your, what's the sense of the mood music you're getting amongst players out there about, is this going to mean my, you know, my kind of high quality products that I used to be able to export won't happen anymore? Will I have the same market access? What's the, what's the mood music on this, Eva? It's a little bit mixed, huh? 
Um, it's a little bit mixed. I'm, I'm very glad that uh, that you that you invited me to this panel to bring uh, to bring a different a different perspective. Uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, the one of of Europe and and the European businesses on the ground. Uh, for us, the, the, the dual circulation strategy is about a bit of squaring the circle. It's about boosting demand and creating production from the internal market, but also reducing dependency on external inputs for key technologies. So the idea is to cut vulnerabilities, which is good, but maintaining the benefits of China's position in the in the in the global world. And 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 it's it's a bit of a complicated um, um, squaring of the circle uh, to achieve. From a trade perspective, there are some angles that I think require. Uh, thinking um, on, on our side, and that has caught the attention of, of our companies. The first part is uh, reducing dependency, because mm -hmm. this also comes as a name of import substitution, and that is the part that worries us. China wants to invest more in strategic industries, to take control of key added value technologies and to enhance its industrial and supply chains. And this is very much uh, the same as we had read on the Made in China 2025 in everything but in name. And we hope that this will certainly not uh, end up in 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 a, in a full scale decoupling, uh, and and hopefully maybe will be uh, limited and and to key sectors, and and hopefully will not result in 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 isolation. And that that is not something that we would like to see. And I was heartened by by the comments of Mr. Uh, Councillor earlier on that this will not be the case. There's also concerns about efficiency, because we know what happens when specific sectors are identified as key, when financing is made available, and when SOEs are given a, a central role. Uh, we're concerned that there could be uh, new, again, inefficiencies related to um, overcapacity. From an investment perspective, China has made clear that they want to continue attracting key um, investments into key technologies and making sure that value chains remain well embedded in China but also taking more control of them. So there are opportunities for European businesses in China, but there are also, there are also risks. Uh, we all know that doing business in China is not easy. In particular, it comes uh, attached with conditions that are specific for foreign investors, something that we have long been complaining about. We'd like to, um, to benefit from the same welcoming uh, conditions that Chinese investors enjoy in, in the EU. Um, and the specific conditions uh, that are attached to uh, to, to investors, uh, some of them are, are 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 more transparent than others, and some are less transparent and more difficult uh, to navigate. Uh, when we are talking about uh, upgrading and, and attracting key technologies, uh, issues of forced technology transfer and intellectual property uh, protection of property rights become even more of an important uh, issue to, to, to make sure that is addressed. And state-owned enterprises will remain the main competitors. They, mm -hmm. they, they, have, a, they have a very important role uh, in developing industrial policies attributed to the state, and they're not easy competitors. Uh, and there's also, also the question about how long will the opportunities last, because, because China is very innovative, and it also has a very fast path of, of digesting uh, technologies and, and know-how. So, so in conclusion, China has a strategy, and that's good. It's ambitious, and that's good. Um, but the means deployed for this strategy need to be transparent and, and fair and equal conditions for all. And foreign companies have to balance risks and opportunities, short-term games versus long-term competitiveness. Eva, that's really helpful. Can you just stay on and just kind of respond to this particular question from you that occurs to me? That I think that, you know, you've seen um, a major uh, trade deal, investment deal with China with between the EU. I, are some of these issues that you've just raised about, you know, um, balance, um, fairness, uh, an equal playing field, are these being are, are these addressed in the detail of the agreement? Are you seeing signs of that? And obviously, Sheng Chao, you may wish to come in later on because these are you know when you the commentary, the public narrative is there's low detail in the plan, but you know there is an investment deal to be had, and people are absolutely clear because let's not face let's not, let's not uh, ignore the fact that markets matter, and so does you know money, and we know where markets are shifting in terms towards the. East and we see the greatest growth there. And so companies are naturally going to gravitate in that, in that direction, especially in the context of the economic crisis we find ourselves in. But Eva, do you see signs of uh, improvement in some of the points you've just identified in the actual text of agreements? 
Well, the investment agreement was one of the tools that uh, that, uh, that the EU uh, has uh, to articulate a, a very complex and multifaceted relationship with China, and indeed to, to, to rebalance a part of the relationship that we felt was not very, very well balanced. And, and to address the reality that you just mentioned, the fact that uh, EU has uh, a lot of investment in China and that the European companies intend to remain here. So we tried to really improve the situation, addressing some of those concerns, and we did agree with China, very high level and very ambitious rules, specifically on uh, state-owned enterprises, transparency of subsidies, uh, forced technology transfers, and, and in general, the regulatory environment. Um, the investment agreement did contain rules that, uh, that would have helped us uh, level the playing field. But um, yeah, as, as our Vice President Dombrovskis has said, uh, the prospects for the ratification of that deal will depend on how the situation evolves. And, and it's uh, we don't operate in the vacuum. Uh, the ratification process cannot be separated from the evolving dynamics of the, bra of the broader EU-China relationship. So um, le le let us hope uh, for the better. Indeed, as I mentioned earlier, there is that wider context that we, uh, is undeniable, despite the reality of market forces. Thank you, Eva. That was really very helpful. Um, and again, I encourage you those of you to put your hands up. Uh, otherwise, I will come and pick on you. I want to move to, uh, uh, to Huang. Huang uh, Professor Huang uh, Ping, tell me from, and uh, th thank you very much for joining us. It's good to have you with us. Hi, hello. Hello. Again, thank you, all of you, and my pleasure. Uh, my Great. understanding, uh, first of all, very briefly, this is quite a new concept after a long time of discussions yeah. how China should go ahead. Indeed. For a more balanced, more balanced, and a more therefore sustainable uh, development. So rather than saying we will only focus on sort of the Chinese domestic market and therefore its own economy, but mm -hmm. rather after forty years high sort of speed growth development, mm -hmm. there is a need to see. There's another side of the development in China. That mm -hmm. is a huge uh, amount of, in terms of both uh, population market, uh, potential uh, development, etc. A huge part of China has not been so well connected mm -hmm. with the outside. So during the past 40 years, we of course achieved high growth with a high investment, highly also dependent on the uh, uh, overseas economy is always opening uh, towards outside. But in the meantime, we also had this part of China where we need to catch up. So this dual circulation means more that uh, another part of China must mm -hmm. be also okay. uh, mm -hmm. a, a key. Uh, therefore, this is rather not a sort of inward looking, but rather to be a more balanced catch up for the another part of China. Therefore, it can be also a huge opportunity for the outside, for investment from outside. And the dual circulation means you on the one side, the one opening towards outside. But in the meantime, you have to also consider and uh, rebalance our old economy with this kind of, so both for domestic and for international uh, investment. So that can be, instead of sort of uh, against the opening, but rather to be more opening in a more balanced manner. Huang, you've been you've that been involved. You no, know, indeed, in, indeed. No, thank you for for your 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 remark there. But you've been involved in drafting various texts in re, and relationships in terms of some trade, you know, uh, 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 reflections and relationships. But in the context of what we find ourselves, um, you know, if you can reflect on what Eva said, but also what are the other elements in the plan that you might want to draw attention to that. Um, that we may not be as familiar with, for example, that may have implications um, um, for both economic growth in the region, but also further afield. Very briefly. Uh, one of the very important differences, I would argue, is that instead of only focusing on the growth, uh, GDP or whatever uh, indicators, the growth, 
but rather high growth, but rather high quality of the development. Second, instead of uh, simply rely on the outside market investment, mm -hmm. rather this dual circulation, you emphasize both towards outside, but develop both coastal China and the inner land. Great, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you in a moment because I'm, I'm conscious of time. An hour is such a long, uh, such a short time for conversations like this. But I want to move to uh, Alexandra. Alexandra um, from GIZ, hello. Hello, Kanani. Hello, how are you? Very good to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. So, um, from your perspective, um, please t t respond to some of the things you've heard, but what are the implications both in the region, but you know, in terms of where you see this going and its implications, not only in terms of the, uh, the model that for implications for the region, but also in terms of relationships with Europe? Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts, just uh, for the, the context. We're working um, with China and Germany on climate, biodiversity and environment within my team. And this is a long-standing cooperation. Today, we talk about the implications within the 14th five-year plan and uh, dual circulation. I would like to link it to that, and not because this is my subject, of course, also because it's my subject, but because I think it has wider implications and it relates from my point of view very well to what we just heard from previous speakers. Um, I think, and my team thinks, and in the cooperation between the two countries, we think the 14th five-year plan with the announcement of the 2030 early peaking and uh, before 2060 carbon neutrality of China is a game changer for multiple reasons. And this plays also together with the dual circulation and my perception. Um, first of all, I think it's good to, to clarify to colleagues on, online why is it a game changer? Hmm. The China is very active in the climate subject, as everybody knows. Since 1992, they are um, engaged in uh, they were engaged in the Rio summit. And all the years after, they were heavily engaged in the the way um, the world is designing the yeah the approach how to deal with the impact of climate change. Um, together with the U.S. before 2015, the Paris Agreement, they agreed on how to do it. It actually happened. We have the Paris Agreement because of the agreement between China and the U.S. And there is an important role, maybe not everybody online is aware of. China is a part of the group of so-called G77 plus China. So China is the spokesperson, if you want to call it that way, for 77 developing countries. So why is it now a game changer with the 14th five-year plan? And why bringing all this up in this context? Because in the 14th five-year plan, this is the announced goal of carbon neutrality and early peaking and the dual circulation and a more inward focus for lifting the quality of production, industry, the mm. way people live. Um, this goes together with uh, the, the stepping up the whole yeah, the whole society of China towards a more sustainable and carbon friendly approach. We all know that China is currently producing roughly 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. China is aware of this impact, what this has to the world. The dual circulation, from my point of view, and living in China for three years with my family, I think it has the chance to make this urgently needed, more inward looking possible to improve the quality of products, to improve the production, the, um, the value chain. And then in, in a context of circular economy and, and a more sustainable production and, art of, and way of living, we have the chance to the dual circulation playing very well together with the same approach on carbon neutrality and early peaking. And the, the shift, which I mentioned earlier, and also the link to China's role in the world, is that with the 14th five-year plan and this carbon neutrality goal and the, the, the stepping up of the inward looking, China acknowledged without really saying it, that they are leaving the status of developing country to a mid-income country. I know that for you in Europe, you only see the, if you want to say, rich China, but of course, China is vast, 1.4 billion people. And even though they lifted 800 million out of poverty, there are still millions of millions of people who are poor. So 
this is an important context to understand from the outside looking. Mm -hmm. And this is dual circulation. I think we have the chance to engage not only on, on um, climate policy and environment policies, where China is already working a lot in the last decades, to link this with the production, which is, by the way, bought from the whole world. So as we know, China is producing for all of us, for my families in Europe, in Germany, for you guys everywhere in the world. The production here is um, uh, sort of active. We have uh, growth rates from 20% in some of the industries and so on. So my point is, I think this dual circulation combined with the um, high-level announcement of carbon neutrality embedded in the 14th five-year plan, we will see in the framework of the 14th five-year plan between 2021 and 2025 um, a major shift. So I think that's my main point, okay. Anani, if that makes sense to you. It does, and you've provided a kind of a fresh or distinct reflection in that actually just like anywhere in the world it depends on what your starting point is and your entry point and as you, you set out very clearly on an issue uh, of in terms of tackling climate change but also development um, it's an interesting and fresh take as I say that many many from the outside may not have taken account of or may not see as being significant but you've you've set that out extremely well and it just suggests that you know there is so much more to be had by having constant engagement and discussion on many levels if we're to shift the dial on some of these issues, especially about perceptions uh, of relationships, but also moving our relations into something which is a truly interdependency, uh, which we cannot deny in, in the modern world. But we need to be able to work through these issues. So thank you very much for that. Um, I want to bring in a couple of people, uh, quite, quite, quite a few of you have now raised your hand, which is great. Adam, Adam Isaacs, is that right? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Hello. Um, would you would you introduce yourself very briefly and then very briefly say what your question is? Thank you. Um, I'm the head of the European Parliament's uh, unit for relations with the United States and Canada. So obviously, the last few years we heard a lot about how the US sees uh, relations with China. I found this morning really useful because it reminds us of the nuances and that um, the whole question of relations with China going forward is one that. Um, cannot be reduced to slogans or simple answers. Um, this concept of dual circulation of two things in harmony um, made me think, how, do, how does this square with the political approach which is being taken, particularly we in the European Parliament feel? Um, we will have to um, approve the comprehensive agreement on investment soon. And we are obviously looking for China to partner with us as we tackle climate emergency. But how does this square with the measures taken against our human rights subcommittee and the five uh, members of the European Parliament, including the chair of our delegation for relations with China, who have been subject to sanctions by the Chinese government? How do these two approaches of the looking to cooperate and at the same time being subject to this aggressive wolf warrior diplomacy and sanctions, how does this square in harmony because the two approaches seem to push in different directions. Adam, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. And it's one of these kind of, the, it is the ongoing dilemma or rather the kind of uh, the, the situation we find ourselves in is the sense of the, this, uh, the balance, the dilemma, but this distinction of the relations um, in terms of, uh, you know, what does it mean in terms of, uh, you know, the, the model uh, that you can see and you can this nuanced and actually it's a development that many countries are doing and obviously you know some might say that what's happening in in terms of dual circulation is another name that Europe uses as strategic autonomy and you know that might just be you know that that might be the case as some of you have commented in the chat so I think I will come back to uh, uh, Chao and others to actually comment on what you said because this is a this is a constant and recurrent theme is how do you balance uh, issues of, let's say, human rights, values, etc., uh, uh, and the fact that, you know, there are uh, very good um, deals to be had or relationships, but also a sense of interdependency, as I said earlier. I want to move to um, Sarah Ann. Yes, hello, and thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Ann Arab, and I'm a reporter with Politico Europe. Hello, Sarah. Um, hi. I'm, I'm wondering now with the souring relations um, between the EU and China, with the new U.S. administration and now the G7 today, um, which will also discuss China from a trade perspective, um, how do you see a path forward towards de-escalation? 
on uh, the political side of things, which will inevitably also have an impact on the economic um, trade perspective. And also, if I may, um, what does dual circulation mean for regions within Asia? Mm -hmm. So for, for supply chains that are perhaps more regional. Thank you. Sarah, thank you very much for bringing that, especially the, I mean, the first question we are all concerned about, obviously, and that, as I said earlier, and Adam has referred to another says that, you know, there, there is a global interdependency. I mean, we might have re responded as a world that the pandemic, pandemic has meant, let's get rid of globalization, let's reduce our, our reliance on international global supply chains. That's just a foolhardy premise. You know, we can't turn back the clock on globalization. But what we do need to do is engage in effective diplomacy to make sure we're able to move in a, di in a direction that's effective. But I, I will ask again, uh, Minister Council, to come back on your point very specifically. But others also in this, in this, in this space who are either working regionally uh, or companies that are already operating and are looking at this, answer that question. What does it mean for you? Uh, we, look to, you know, we look forward to hearing from you. But Sarah, and thank you very much for that very specific thing about what happens to the kind of the region around uh, China in terms of dual circulation. I'm going to move to uh, Crystal. We have a question, I think, I believe, from our live, live stream audience. Um, hi, Sandra, can you hear me? I can indeed. Warm welcome to you, Crystal. All right, thank you. So the question actually today comes from Ziad Hamoui, who is a national president of the Borderless, Borderless Alliance sorry, in Ghana. And his question refers to the recent blockade of the Suez Canal, which reinforced what COVID taught us over the past couple of years. Global value chains are getting too long and risky. So how will drill circulation address this concern? Will it adapt or adjust the long-term development footprint of China? Great. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you, Crystal. And now, finally, I want to move to Minia, if I have that right, the pronunciation. Uh, yes, uh, yes, you do, but you already uh, kindly mentioned uh, my, my question, which, uh, which is um, uh, how, uh, how do uh, discussions uh, assess the, uh, the potential parallel between uh, this concept of uh, paradigm of uh, dual uh, uh, circulation and uh, the discussion in Europe on uh, strategic autonomy? Because lots of uh, elements, lots of terms are, are uh, overlapping. Indeed. Thank sorry, you. and sorry, sorry to have suggested I've uh, taken, taken the thunder, but I don't think it's still important to hear your voice. Tell, just before you go, um, just introduce yourself. Where are you from? What do you do? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, together with another uh, colleague uh, that's, uh, that's uh, in attendance, uh, we, are, uh, we are part of the Commission's uh, in-house uh, think tank uh, idea. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, can, um, Eva, can I bring you in on the, uh, before I go back to Minister Councillor and Fong and, uh, and Huang perhaps, you've heard from Politico that question about what are the, you know, what are the, what are the levers for de-escalation that we have currently? Um, and I know that, you know, that's not necessarily your purview, but I suppose what it is your purview is, what does it mean for the region? around, you know, what, what does it mean for countries around uh, China in terms of dual circulation? Well, um, okay, I think on the escalation, uh, as, as you said, it's not really my purview. Um, as, uh, the, as, I said, as I said before, the EU has been making really every effort to foster a balanced and rules-based uh, trade and investment and broader economic relations uh, with China. And the investment agreement was part of this effort. We always said it wasn't a magic wand. It was never meant to address all of, uh, of the issues uh, that arise in a, in a very complex and multifaceted relationship. But it was meant to be one of the tools in helping us. And there were other tools that we were also putting in place uh, to ensure a level playing field in the internal market and, and to, 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 to make sure that, um, that we are maybe not as, uh, as, as, as naive as sometimes we have been accused of being in the past. Um, but our trade and economic agenda has European values as its core, and, and we've said that all along. And, and pushing our economic interests goes hand in hand with standing up for our values. Um, sometimes that means imposing sanctions, uh, as has have been the case here. Um, yeah, it, it's fair to say that uh, that the reaction um, that that uh, to our sanctions uh, was was not the one expected. We had expected to be able to engage. Um, and, and what we've got is a, is, is a much more 
complicated message um, that is going to be difficult to um, to digest. I think I think uh, to a large extent the, the the way forward is in the hands of China. So I very much look forward to answering the question of um, to, to the minister councillor, um, uh, my homonym in, in in the EU, to see to see uh, what what he can offer uh, as means of uh, of, mean, of means forward. And also, um, I think they are best placed to 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 address what are the impacts that they see of the dual circulation strategy in the broader in the broader China region. Okay. I do see that it has a potential for affecting global value chains mm -hmm. and attracting key aspects of it uh, to China, uh, but I would imagine that they have thought the plan through um, with respect to impacts on the region. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested sure. in that. Okay. All right. There are companies in this audience. Can I just ask some of you to, who are, you know, operating or, or, or trading uh, to raise your hand, engage in this? What, you know, what do you see? How do you see it from your perspective? Or trades councils, you know, what, what's, what, where, where do you see this going for you? would be really good to have your perspective. So don't be shy and do come in. Um, Joanna, I think we had a question from you. Is that the case? I think you've put something on the chat. Uh, I did, actually. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, I'm Joanna Klabisch. I'm from the Foundation ASEAN House in Germany. We are focused on strengthening civil society. Mm -hmm. And in this regard, we've had a lot of contact with many kinds of associations who have represented companies and others where the question was always um, from the EU side, we want more reciprocity, we want more access. Currently, if you compare the European market and its openness to that of China and their openness, we are at a very harsh disadvantage. And that's been going on for many years. And to many, this dual circulation ter term, while absolutely understandable, seems just like a step backwards um, towards less openness, mm -hmm. even though earlier our Chinese guest mentioned it would stay open. Mm -hmm. So this dichotomy, I was just wondering how that can be explained. Okay, and again, this go also, I mean, I, I, t I take your point, but again, I, you, know, would, you know, if you, those of you who are companies, um, it would be really get, good to get kind of a ground up view. Uh, what does it feel like for you? What, you know, how is it? Uh, do you feel a change of tone? Do you feel a change of access? Uh, so, because actually you're in the game, um, uh, you're in the trade. So if there are companies in the audience, I'd really do uh, welcome uh, a, a comment from yourselves, if you would, before we are able to conclude this conversation, because that, I think that would be meaningful and we'll get it, you know, direct from the experience. Now, I want to kind of both uh, Fong and Huang, before I turn to Sheng Chao, what are your reactions to what you've heard so far from colleagues in this conversation? Huang, if I can turn to you first. Thank you. Again, very briefly, I would just say, as many of you have already expressed, the China actually is the continent in terms of both the economy and the development. So therefore, the dual circulation, even as a new concept, act provides more opportunities for investment, for development, for both China and outside. So within China, we need a kind of more integrated and more balanced development for employment, for growth, for whatever. Uh, as someone has mentioned, there are also another hundreds of millions of people. And also for the countries around China, this is, can also be an opportunity for China to be more connected with. And globally, in spite of the pandemic, the globalization, many kinds of other kinds of uh, populism, uh, imbalance in terms of trade, if this dual circulation uh, works rather than sort of separating between even within China, coastal China, central China, western China, but rather a dual circulation actually is an overlapped uh, way of developing its economy and uh, therefore opening its also inner land towards outside can be also an opportunity for the other investors, developers, as well as the consumers. So I would rather see from this new five-year program and onwards, mm -hmm. so there will be a more opening China. 
uh, for all of us. Okay. Therefore, even in terms of so-called uh, the economy and the politics, if there are more opportunity, more development for inner land, therefore that uh, your society will be more open towards outside. Okay, thank you very thank much you. for that. Thank you. Fong, if I can ask you to respond to the issues around what, more specifically, what are the implications for, um, you know, the uh, countries around China in terms of due circulation? What will it mean? Well, uh, I, as I've said, China, uh, we adhere to a higher level of opening up. So uh, right now we have this RCP and uh, also the comprehensive agreement on investments with the EU. So about RCP and some, some of you mentioned uh, what's the impact of the, the, the dual circulation on the uh, Asian region, the countries around China. So uh, what I should, what I could say is that right now we are discussing, uh, well, uh, how, how to deal actually the impact of the RCP uh, at the provincial level. So uh, the provinces, they are making uh, five-year plans of themselves. So especially about you know, what kind of impact uh, these kinds of opening uh, of the agreement might bring uh, to Chinese uh, industry, especially the textile industry. Uh, we all know that uh, Vietnam, they all they are very competitive in this respect. So actually we are discussing about what kind of impact it may have on, on our own industries. And we also worry that uh, the Chinese textile industry might also get some hollow up. I mean, uh, they the companies might uh, want to move their uh, companies to, to the uh, Southeast Asian um, countries. So that is indeed something we are talking about. And in response to, uh, to that question about, well, uh, why China uh, seem less developed than before. I mean, uh, China would, uh, whether or not would retreat back. So uh, I think, uh, well, China is less developed, uh, was less developed in the past. Uh, we all know that. So uh, right now we are uh, making a lot of measures trying to promote this kind of uh, 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 domestic circulation. So for example, the state council is uh, advancing the reform on deregulation of so management and services and trade facilitation and integration of uh, certificates and licenses also have provided many conveniences for the enterprises. And the negative list of the foreign investment ha uh, has also shrunk further uh, compared to that of last year. And we have also free trade ports, pilot free trade zones, etc. So these are all measures we have taken trying to promote this uh, dual mm -hmm. circulation further. And recently, we talk about, we see the sanctions, okay, between China and the EU. Mm -hmm. I think these have made the situation worse. So, uh, and but these are never what we want. So I think uh, if the political opposition lasted, the grassroots people's mood would get seriously affected. So uh, the business uh, environment might turn to deterioration. And uh, while well, these negative influences are not a systematic arrangement, it's just out of human nature. What I mean is that, well, uh, as Chinese people, uh, I think uh, the European people respect uh, diversity. We are so different. China is different from uh, the, the uh, from Europe. So uh, I I I I think you should not force China to do what you want. So uh, well, uh, it's we need more uh, actually uh, understanding. So um, uh, and. Uh, China EU relations are in a very delicate stage. I think how China interacts with the EU will depend on the EU first. So we are kind of passive and reactive. So see that the thank US you, has. Uh, thank well, you. Thank yeah. you very much for that. And thank you for responding, you know, because this is, a, you know, one of the reasons why we have this program and why we in, engage in this is that the, one of the things that we've learned from diplomacy historically is that you need to keep those channels open. And how do you make sure you create common understanding or at least be able to, you know, seek out those areas where you can actually have a conversation. Withdrawing and putting up the barriers is not going to help any of us. Sheng Chao, can I ask you to come in here and respond to some of those questions? You know, there's an audience here that would love to hear from your, your reaction to what you've heard about the issue that we've had from the Parliament, uh, what we have from Sarah and from Politico and a number of others about balancing this issue about um, the reality of economic trade uh, and economic growth uh, 
uh, we've heard the positive from GIZ about you know some of the things you're doing on carbon neutrality uh, and moving uh, moving in that way are kind of uh, are, are are I suppose single and uh, you know on, on par to nobody else in terms of the level of investment. But it's about making sure that we open continue the dialogue. And I suppose it doesn't help either side saying it's up to you. It's up to you. We're not going to get anywhere. But you. Tell us what, from your perspective, um, what your views are and what you've heard. Thank you, Damendra. And uh, I think one hour is really flying. Uh, Isn't it? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yes, yes. And so I will try to be brief. And uh, first, I still would like to say a few words about the dual circulation, as I know that the, in the audience there is uh, quite interest in dual circulation. And I could not go, to the, go into the details. But I think that the dual circulation, I just want to say, say that uh, we know that the pandemic has changed many things. But the one thing, even this pandemic has not changed, is China's resolve to continue to go ahead with its reform and opening up. It has <coughs> pursued this reform and opening up policy for more than four decades. It has benefited hugely from this bad policy. So we do believe in free trade. We do believe in an open economic and business environment, okay? And in the past four decades, we have also learned a lot from our international partners, including Europe. So I think this will not change in China. Okay. So this is the philosophy, development philosophy, openness. Mm -hmm. It's a development philosophy underpinning China's development now and well into the future decades. Indeed. Okay. Sheng Chao, as I'm running out of time, can I just ask you to focus uh, on that? Because I want to bring in one other contributor. I'm going to put you on notice. Julia, Julia from Area, I'd like to hear from you, given the role mm -hmm. that you play. But I'll bring you in a, in a second. But uh, respond to that question that you've heard. You know, there's been a, you know, a tune of it, a theme of it, about balancing the openness or what's seen as being uh, a growth trajectory, uh, which is very determined, very, very clear, but the issues that some of the uh, our colleagues have raised about diplomacy. You know, you hear the head of the trade investment section saying, well, we've tried, it's in China's hands. Um, and, you know, uh, what we heard from others is about what, how do you balance the issue about human rights and the desire to move forward? Do you use this platform to be able to communicate some messages to our audience here this morning. Yeah. We all wish that we could have an ideal environment in which we could only take into consideration just one set of measurements or one set of factors. But uh, to be realistic, we all live in the real world, which means that we have all the different factors bring into play at the same time. You have to deal with opportunities and challenges. That's why sometimes diplomats are important. Uh, I hope that uh, what I'm saying is right and also echoes with Eva. And so uh, I know you said just now that we should not say that it's up to you. So what I would like to say is it's up to us, every one of us, from the Chinese side, from the European side, even our international partners and friends, okay? In this era of pandemic, I could not think of a worse time mm -hmm when we should have such a fallout between China and Europe and between China and other major powers in the world. But we all know it takes two to tangle, okay? <laughs> so I think it's up to all of us mm -hmm. to try to think hard and think about the real gains and losses mm -hmm. we would have Indeed. in such a fallout, okay? Indeed, Indeed. Yes. absolutely. And you know, the world's in a very fragile place. And I think that brinkmanship doesn't help anybody, but nor does it help anybody to shirk away or to, you know, to move away from the difficult issues that you know, the globe faces, both in terms of human rights, equality, diversity, and making sure that we level up the playing field for those of us who are the poorest in our communities globally also. And trade and economics can play its part, but I, don't, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I think it's an important message you've communicated today, which I'm very pleased that you didn't say, well, actually, no, it's not us, it's them. And that notion of it takes two to tango, and you're quite right. So I'm hoping that diplomacy uh, 
Eva, Sanchao and others, the diplomacy will come to force because that's what we need. There's no point uh, having escalation when really at the heart of this, uh, we've just gone through one of the biggest, harshest uh, crises in, in, our, in our living world, uh, in our history. And what we ought to do is learn from some of the messages uh, of what, what we have gained in terms of our progressive politics and democracies. Before I conclude, Julia, if I can ask you to just come in, say a little bit about uh, your perspective, very briefly, because I'm conscious of what you do, but for the rest of this audience, very briefly say what area does, and then I'm going to wrap up in a moment. Thank you very much for calling me in at the very end of this interesting conversation. My name is Julia Mone Marsan, and I'm the Director for Strategy and Partnership at ARIA, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. It's an international organization with the membership, the ASEAN Plus Six, and we support uh, the process of uh, socioeconomic integration in the region. Mm -hmm. And very briefly, I'm very glad that someone uh, mentioned RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnerships, uh, uh, maybe a couple of minutes ago, because I invite all European friends to have you know, a broader picture of what's happening in the region, uh, also, also, of course, including China, uh, while many people are talking about, you know, uh, shorter value chains and uh, looking at globalization in a different perspective, Southeast Asia and East, East Asia and the Pacific more in general are actually trying to uh, go forward and integrate uh, economically speaking. We don't know yet what the consequences will be of this, you know, mega trade agreement, but uh, I think it will be very important to look at the relationship between China and other Euro Asian countries also to understand the consequences uh, uh, with respect to economic integration in these specific regions in the world, which is the fastest growing region uh, at the moment. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I, I was pleased to bring you in. I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to bring you in earlier. But at that point, you know, and I think that um, it's, we forget that it's not just China, but the whole of Asia is in a growth trajectory that we cannot deny. And, you know, in terms of the population growth, the largest middle class that's going to you know, be upon us globally, there's an unassailable fact if you look at, you know, trajectories and trends that are emerging. And actually, that, that there's a wider development that we might lose sight of by just focusing on the one. And, that we, and also that, that very sage, uh, 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 I suppose, wise comment about, you know, don't just look at it from one perspective, but see what's happening under the underbelly of the region as well and more widely because actually there are other things that are taking place and, and you know, markets are moving in a direction regardless of this dialogue about just EU-China, but a wider Asia perspective is very, very important. <clears throat> I think it's important that, um, that I want to draw reference to one of our trustees, if you can see on the chat, who's had to leave. And Yves, Yves Terme is a very well-known uh, you know, protagonist in the EU, uh, but as you can see, you can uh, please do reflect on his uh, uh, chat comment. It'll be good to continue this chat, but I have to draw this debate to, a, to an end, I'm afraid. I'm already four minutes over. Um, and as Sheng Chao said, you know, an hour's too short. You're absolutely right, Sheng Chao. Thank you uh, for being with us. Um, if there's any final word you want to leave, please do so. Otherwise, I'll conclude the debate. Sheng Chao? You're muted. And now I would say it's not the best of the times for everybody, okay, given the pandemic and given what happened also in the Suez Canal and many other places, we can see that there are many volatilities in today's world. So I think it is all the more important that we should learn to agree to disagree and learn to cooperate more and work, that, work together for the benefit of the whole human race. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Sang Chao and others. This has been um, a very good debate, I hope you think, that we haven't kind of, you know, um, looked away from each other. We've eyed each other. Uh, we've looked at the difficult issues and not shied away from dealing with some of those thorny debates. As I said, you know, diplomacy is important in these times and we mustn't lose sight of where we find ourselves suddenly in this early part of the century. And it's only dialogue and discussion that will move us forward and become and ensure that we continue to be progressive. This forms a part of our EU-China dialogue series, but also sits within a wider programme of EU-Asia activities and conversations and dialogues 
If you want to have more information about what we do, go, please do email us. You know where we are and you know how to contact us. If you want to engage in our EU, our wider EU Asia program, please get in touch. Uh, there are a range of other dialogues that we have in terms of EU China dialogues, but also EU uh, Asia dialogues planned for the remainder of the year. If you have an interest in those and want to see some of this action and be part of it, please do get in touch. From my part, thank you very much. I'm Domendra Kanani, I'm Chief Spokesperson at Friends of Europe, but also Director of the Asia Programme. Very good to have been with you. Thank you all and um, look forward to seeing you all very soon. Take care, mind your distance and be safe. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.